Hey y'all, in today's video we're going to talk about fitness. So, in an effort to keep us all in good shape over this extended break, I am encouraging us as our assignments to do at least 100 push-ups a day, probably 100 squats, and 100 sit-ups. We'll convert like bio class into fitness class. April Fools. I'm not talking about that kind of fitness. Nah, I'm not talking about that kind of fitness. Though it is important to stay physically fit during these days. Do some push-ups. What I'm really talking about today in this video is about the biological concept of fitness, which has to do with evolution. In simplest terms, fitness is going to be the ability to survive and reproduce in a given environment. The more fit an animal it is, the better it is able to survive and reproduce and pass on its genes. The less fit an animal it is, the less likely it is to survive and reproduce. So let's record that concept of fitness in our notes. If you turn to page 104, you'll notice that we've already taken some notes on things like adaptations and natural selection. I wanna add on this last key vocabulary word for natural selection, which is the idea of biological fitness. Like I stated earlier, biological fitness is going to be the ability of an organism to survive and reproduce. As I stated earlier, some organisms are gonna be considered more fit than others, and some are going to be considered less fit than others. That means the more fit an animal is, the more likely it is to survive and reproduce. Let's dive into the main topic of today, which is types of selection. Finding your new blank page, which should be page 108, let's get a new definition for natural selection in terms of fitness. Most of you guys are familiar with the phrase survival of the fittest. Be careful because remember it's survival and reproduction of the fittest. Because in order for evolution to occur, you actually need populations to evolve over generations. Now that we have an idea of what fittest means, we understand that's just the animals with the best adaptations for surviving and reproducing. Today we're going to talk about three types of selection that fall within the category of natural selection. Go ahead and divide up your notes so that you have three different sections. We're going to be drawing three different graphs and examining these in three different scenarios. Let's take a look at some of these concepts with my friends. Hang on a second, I'm going to introduce them to you. Today we will be talking about types of selection with these unfortunate souls. The bunnies. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ms. Lim, you're a grown woman. What are you doing with all those stuffed animals? Let me explain. I am at my parents' house, helping them clean out my old childhood closet, came across all the stuffed animals. You know what? We might as well have some fun in these biology videos while we're making them. So without further ado, let's see how selection processes work on bunnies. It's bunny survival time, scenario one. As you can see, I have a beautiful population of bunnies. They are all very different from each other in size, shape, color, ear length, tail length, etc. For this scenario though, I am going to sort them by color. Give me a sec. Now we have bunnies that are ranging from dark, beautiful skin color to light, beautiful skin color. In fact, we can make a graph that represents this in which phenotype is my x-axis. So if I wanted to draw a graph of these bunnies over time, I would put in my y-axis and my x-axis. On the y-axis, I would call that the number of individuals, so the number of bunnies that I have. Okay. And then on the x-axis, I would talk about the phenotype differences. So this, in this case, it would be fur color. I may go fur color from extremely light to extremely dark. And then that would imply that the middle of my x-axis is the medium color for. My bunnies start off with a pretty even spread of phenotypes from light coats to dark coats, about the same number of individuals for all. In most populations, you're going to see a very slight rise in the middle of the phenotypes and you have a lower percentage of the two extremes. This is where we get that classic bell curve that's usually used to describe populations. 
Most bunnies live in a beautiful snowy wasteland. As you can see, there are already some problems with camouflage. They happily munch along until one day they introduce a predator. <laughs> see, after this horrible tragedy, only certain type of bunnies are left behind. The light-colored <laughs> ones who camouflaged well. They will go on to pass on their genes to the next generation. Within no time, this population will be very light-coated and well-camouflaged. They have evolved. Wow, that was a terrifying and tragic massacre. Let's discuss what this looks like on our graph. So I'm going to choose a different color to represent my population after the selection. If we remember, the dark bunnies were not able to camouflage, so they were quickly weeded out. They were not fit. However, light bunnies were considered more fit in this scenario, and my number of individuals for light bunnies by the end of several generations would have increased dramatically. Medium bunnies would probably have a fairly medium chance of survival. What we start to see is a shift in the curve, so that instead of favoring the middle slightly, Instead, I shift in one direction towards one extreme phenotype. I'm going to call it a phenotypic shift. This type of selection is called directional selection. The reason why it's called directional selection, you can probably guess, is because the population shifts in one direction. The population is going to be shifting towards one extreme phenotype. So our definition would be selection in which the population shifts, the population phenotype, let's say, shifts towards one extreme. By extreme, I'm saying either light or dark, nothing in the middle, nothing intermediate. Welcome back to Bunny Island. It's time for scenario two. As you can see in scenario two, I'm gonna look at the bunnies not based on their fur coats, but on their size, going from biggest to smallest. You'll notice that we have also introduced a new element into our environment, the cave. Looking at scenario two, I want you to pause the video for a second and set up a second graph in the same manner. Your y-axis would be the number of individuals. Your x-axis would be the phenotype that we're looking at, going from small to large. Remember that the original population is going to be a nice, gentle bell curve. Slightly more medium rabbits than we have small or large rabbits. The bunnies are happily going about their business. And then, predator approaches. surviving members of the bunny population are the small ones who are able to run away to the caves and the large one who is able to scare off the predator. After that hilarious jolly little romp, what happened to our population of bunny rabbits? What we noticed is that small bunny rabbits were better able to survive the predator by hiding in the cave. As a result, they were able to survive and reproduce more, they were more fit, there's a high number of small bunny rabbits. Large bunny rabbits were able to scare off the predator from their sheer terrifying size. So once again, they had a higher rate of survival and reproduction. However, the low fitness bunny rabbits were the medium ones who could neither hide in the cave nor scare off their predators. What this then starts to show us as a population curve is gonna be something that looks a little bit like a U, in which the population starts to favor either small or large bunny rabbits, but does not favor medium-sized bunny rabbits. This type of selection is going to be called disruptive selection. 
The way that I remember how this graph is associated with disruptive selection is the fact that it looks like if there was an even sand pit here and then someone just started digging a hole in the middle. Pretty disruptive, if you ask me. My definition for disruptive selection is going to be selection in which the two extreme phenotypes are favored. So the way that this differs from directional selection up at the top is going to be the fact that I have two extremes favored, both small and large, both ends of the spectrum. Whereas in directional selection, I only had one extreme favored going towards just the light for colored coats. Now this takes us to our last type of selection, scenario three. Once again, let's look at the bunnies in terms of their phenotypes being biggest to smallest. And now to set up your graph for scenario number three, it should look very similar to the graph for scenario number two. This is what my graph for scenario number three looks like. The only thing I need to be aware of is that my x-axis phenotype I'm investigating now is small to large or size. Original population, beautiful bell curve. Let's plot or let's see what's gonna happen to these poor bunnies. In this case, the selecting factor is going to be food. Food is only available on top of a ledge and inside a small crevice. Now I want to compete for food. Unfortunately, the short bunnies are too short and cannot reach the food on the ledge. They will die of starvation. Blech. They can easily reach the ledge. However, the crevice is too narrow. Oh, I don't... Oh, this bunny will also die of starvation. It leaves us with only our medium-sized bunnies. Perfect height to hop up to the ledge, perfect paw shape to reach in and grab their food. <laughs> These bunnies will go on to survive and pass on their medium-sized genes to their offspring. This very sad scenario, what we noticed was that small bunnies were way too small to hop up to the ledge and get their carrots. They were selected against, and they were not fit for the environment. Likewise, large bunnies, while tall enough to reach the ledge, were not able to fit their large paws into the crevice to access the carrots. They were also selected against and not fit for the environment. The only rabbits that were fit for the environment were the medium-sized bunnies. The ones that were both tall enough to actually hit the ledge and who had small enough paws to reach into the crevice. What we then start to see with the population over time is that medium-sized rabbits will be favored as they have greater access to the resources, have a higher chance of surviving and reproducing, are overall more fit. This type of selection is gonna be called stabilizing selection. Once again, the way that I remember all of these different types of graphs and what they look like is based on their visual appearance. To me, stabilizing selection looks a lot like a little mountain or a little hill, and I can imagine that a hill or a mountain is extremely stable structure. My definition for stabilizing selection is gonna be selection in which the intermediate phenotypes are favored. Intermediate being those middle phenotypes, the ones that are neither extreme in the range. Whereas the extremes are selected against. You'll notice I'm using this language over and over. Favored would be something that is selected for. Selected against means that these animals are not fit for their environment and they're not as likely to be surviving and reproducing. To wrap up of today, we define natural selection as being survival and reproduction of the fittest. And we looked at three different types of selection. All of them have a particular graph associated with them based on what types of phenotypes are selected for or against. Directional selection tends to favor one extreme phenotype, either going towards one side or the other side of my x-axis. Disruptive selection is that weird hole in the middle of the graph in which I favor both extremes of my phenotypes. And finally, stabilizing selection is the one that's going to look like a very stable mountain type shape it is going to be where the medium or intermediate phenotypes are favored, whereas the extreme phenotypes are selected against. Now, I use the idea of size and fur color as my different adaptations that would make my bunny rabbits selected for or against. All sorts of different phenotypes actually play in this in the real world. So I could have things like spots, eye color, toe number, beak shape, 
Anything that is a phenotypic adaptation can be something that is one of these three selections. What's up for today, students? Hey. Um, I encourage you now to get take a look at your practice assignment that's due on Friday. You should be able to complete section number two fairly easily now using the notes that you just took. Many thanks to all of my collaborators for their willingness to sacrifice themselves. Lavender, Lucien, Lucien Jr., Mushu, Bunny, Bunny 2, Sarah Rabbit, Tommy the Lion, and <laughs> not least, my sister, Anna. Remember, students, make it a great day and make it a great day for someone else.